Look at this young bird. No, it's not yelling at the worm, it's waiting for it to jump into its beak. Why? Well, this is how the food used to get there before. The chick just had to open its beak. Once the chicks hatch, they're always hungry. Over a day, the bubble link birds can make 158 trips to deliver food to their chicks. 86 of them are made by the male, 72 by the female. For each delivery, the bird parents must find and catch suitable food, then bring it back to the nest without being spotted by predators. Keep in mind, the chicks need more food with each day. If there isn't enough food or no food at all, the offspring will simply die of hunger because they don't know how to get food on their own. Even if there's a very nutritious worm around, the young bird can't do anything with it. Like that poor thing from the beginning of the video. For the chick to understand where food comes from, it sometimes needs training. For example, robins know exactly where earthworms are because they feel them with their feet when standing on the ground. Well, according to one of the theories. But for the chicks, this isn't so obvious. That's what parents have to demonstrate for them. Look, it's a worm. It comes from the earth. Earth means food. Get it? Birds have to feed their chicks. As soon as they see open beaks, they must immediately put food there. No ifs or buts. You can't do anything about behavior patterns hardwired by nature. The chicks also grow special markings on their beaks. Something like lights on the runway for an airplane, so that their parents definitely don't miss them in the dark. Estral did finches and some other bird species have such markings, and sometimes they look scary. Actually, they're really useful. Scientists even ran experiments and painted over the markings of the chicks. After that, the parents began to feed them less often right away. But unfortunately, estral did finches aren't the only smart guys who've painted their beaks as they evolved. The pintailed whitest chick saw that and evolved very strange beaks too. They just stole someone else's skill. Why? To deceive other birds. Like cuckoos, the pintailed whitest prefer to lay their eggs in other birds' nests. While they don't destroy other birds' chicks, they simply make an addition to the bird family, and the little pintailed whites take care of the rest. They just need to squeak louder and open their mouth wider to get more food. Can you imagine how Estral did Finch's chicks feel about that? Why grow weird things in your mouth if they're of no use? It's like with moles and their forelimbs. I mean, they do need their forelimbs to dig tunnels, and moles excel at that. This is where evolution did a good job. But when they have to go to the surface, and this happens from time to time, they have serious problems. These shoulder joints of moles don't work like that of other animals, and their forelimbs sort of extend to the sides? Well, it's logical for a creature that constantly keeps digging, but this hardly makes things easier for moles. By the way, here's another interesting fact. At the dawn of time, early tetrapods also had limbs that extended laterally, not beneath the body. But over time, they evolved to make it more convenient to walk. As for the moles, well, the moles kept digging and did it well. Scientists have even estimated that, on average, a mole can push the volume of Earth 40 times their own body weight. So actually, moles are doing just fine. The monkeys aren't that lucky. What could monkeys possibly have to blame evolution for? They go bald. Yeah, just like humans. Chimps and stump-tailed macaques do suffer from thinning hair and can go bald as they age. The rhesus macaques lose their fur during or right after pregnancy, just like human females lose hair. While we need hair mostly for the sake of beauty, it has no practical use, it's different for wild animals. They need fur for warmth, cooling, camouflage, sometimes even for carrying their babies. In general, hairless life is hard for them. Well, thanks a lot, evolution. Why the hell did you do that? And what's that? Conjoined crocodiles? They were born on a crocodile farm in Thailand in 2001. Each animal had a head and four legs, but the crocodiles merged in the tail area, so they had to share it. The farm staff took care of the unusual babies because they wouldn't survive on their own. Unfortunately, Steve and I couldn't find what happened to these conjoined crocodiles, but from time to time, two-headed snakes are born, and judging by their fate, the crocodiles can't expect a bright future. Having two heads confuses the snake, it often can't decide which way to crawl, takes too much time eating, and has great trouble hunting. But this is not even the biggest issue, because one head often attacks the other one. Snakes operate a good deal by smell, and if one head catches the scent of prey on the other head, it'll immediately try to swallow it. In captivity, such snakes can be fed using a screen, hiding one head from the other. In the wild, well, you get it, no chance. 
Sometimes evolution makes the life of animals simply unbearable. Something like levels in a game they can't possibly win? Look at Stella, the sand tiger shark with a bent spine. Stella was living in the Mississippi Aquarium when the staff noticed a bend to her spine. For a human, this can feel nasty but not fatal, but for sharks, things work way more different. Stella's bend got so bad she had trouble swimming. In the wild, everything would end at this point, but people performed the first ever surgery on a shark spine. It was damn hard, but it worked. For a few more months, Stella lived a happy shark life. Yes, it's not much, but it's still better than if the shark ended up with a curved spine in the open ocean. However, nature sometimes has rather peculiar ideas about lifespan. Take cicadas, for example. They're insects, but evolution allowed them to live for 17 years. Not every cat lives that long. Periodical cicadas should be grateful for such a gift. But if they really lived for 17 years and multiplied, as insects usually do, they'd have taken over the planet a long time ago. Maybe for that reason, or maybe just to ruin cicadas' long life, evolution decided these flying insects would spend all 17 years underground. After hatching from eggs, cicadas actually burrow into the ground and stay there for many, many years, feeding on the sap from the roots of trees and shrubs. Thankfully, cicada nymphs have a very slow metabolism, otherwise they would have destroyed all the vegetation on the planet. By the age of 8, the nymphs grow up, but stay underground until the age of 17. Only then do they get to the surface and turn into adult cicadas. After that, the insects have 4-6 to six weeks to find a mate and procreate. That is, they're really short on time, so the males make extremely loud sounds thanks to a hollow abdomen, which resonates strongly. And when I say strongly, I mean that cicada calls can be deafening. When this whole swarm, which has been preparing for breeding for 17 years, starts looking for a mate, the noise? Well, you need to hear it yourself. Now imagine the same noise coming not from the speakers. It's all around you, it's everywhere, and it's much more intense. Scientists even measured the noise level of North American cicadas it ranged between 79.8 and 106.2 decibels. There's also a species that emit sounds hitting 108.9 decibels. On a volume scale, this is louder than a jet plane taking off at a distance of 980 feet away from you. A jackhammer or a lawnmower. You can bear these sounds as they don't surround you all the time, but the cicadas really need to multiply and they won't shut up until they're done. Can the cicadas feel they're on a deadline and they have to be as quick as possible? Maybe. That feeling you get when you put off an important task for 17 years, and now you have to do everything in four weeks. But cicadas appeared on our planet, what, more than 200 million years ago? Since they haven't gone extinct yet, this strategy must be working. But what happened to the Galapagos cormorants can hardly be called evolution done right. This species is the only flightless bird in the entire family, and it's also the largest one. At the same time, the wings of the Galapagos cormorant are smaller, the feathers are shorter, the breast muscles are underdeveloped. In general, it looks like this bird has no chance of flying. To find out why, scientists had to look at the bird's genetics. And it turned out that the Galapagos cormorants, let's say, evolved in a somewhat wrong direction. Their genes are busted, just like the genes of people suffering from skeletal ciliopathies. In particular, some people with ciliopathy have short limbs and small chests, just like Galapagos cormorants. It's believed these birds mutated just 2 million years ago, quite recently on the evolutionary timescale. Most likely, they simply moved to islands where there were no predators, dropped their guard, and decided they don't need to fly anymore. Moreover, there's always food they can dive in for, and the wings only get in the way. But the cormorants didn't suspect there would be people nearby who would bring dogs, cats, and rats with them. Now the flightless birds simply have nowhere to go. They don't have time to grow wings again. Well, enough of the sad stuff. Because for some animals, death is actually the only choice given by evolution. I'm talking about male spiders. There are many species whose males do everything to avoid being eaten during or immediately after mating. But not these guys. The males of the redback and brown widow species literally force the females to eat them. Right amidst the mating, the male somersaults flipping his back forward onto the female's mouth parts so she has no choice but to bite him. 
Well, when the enzymes turn the male into jelly, the female eats it. Why waste food? But what's the point of all this? Well, for these species, finding a female and mating with her is already a huge success. Males live a little, most die without leaving offspring. So if they come across a lady and the date went according to plan, then there's no point living anymore. The goal has been achieved. This definitely won't happen a second time. So why not sacrifice yourself for the sake of your future kids? Sounds tough, but these are spiders. They got used to stuff like that. Oh, I almost forgot. I wanted to speak about manatees. Not only because they're funny and look like beanbags with fins, the manatees weren't so lucky either. These are very slow animals that sleep half the day. In the other half, they calmly forage in shallow water, reaching speeds of 3 to 5 miles per hour tops. It's a bit faster than a human walking, but when you're this slow, some can take advantage of it. And I'm not even talking about predators. The skin of manatees is thick but finely wrinkled and constantly flaking off. That's perfect conditions for algae that turn manatees into floating islands. Seriously, sometimes these poor guys are just covered with vegetation. And if the manatee keeps closer to the seacoast, then it can unwittingly become home to barnacles. Looks like a nightmare of a trypophobic person. Ew. And then one of our viewers might say, Listen, what makes you think manatees don't like this? They seem to be quite content. Take a closer look. Unlike dolphins, whales, and seals, manatees are covered in individual hairs, over 3,000 of them, and each one is very sensitive. That's because manatees don't see well, which means they have to rely on other senses. Using their hairs, animals feel the slightest fluctuations in the water in order to understand what's happening around. Now imagine nature gave you a super sensitive external organ, which is always covered by algae, or even barnacles. All these creatures certainly touch and irritate the hairs a lot. Are manatees happy with this gift of evolution? Somehow I doubt that. We'll see you later.